Well, folks, I think we're gonna uh, we're gonna get things going here. All right. So, um, uh, if you just wanna take your seats and uh, we'll get started, I uh, just have a couple of uh, minor introductory minor introductory remarks here. Uh, my name is uh, David Waddington. I'm the uh, co-director of the uh, Center for the Study of Learning and Performance. And the acronym for our center is uh, CSLP. That's what we use uh, online. Uh, we're an educational research center. Uh, I'd like to begin today by acknowledging that Concordia University is located on unceded Indigenous lands, that Ganyankahaka Nation is recognized as the custodians of the lands and waters on which we gather today. Jojage Montreal is historically known as a gathering place for many First Nations, and today it is home to a diverse population of Indigenous and other peoples. We respect the continued connections with the past, present, and future in our ongoing relationships with Indigenous and other peoples within the Montreal community. So this talk today is part of our Center's ongoing speaker series on interdisciplinary perspectives in education. And all of the talks that we have in this series are free and open to the public. And while some of them are geared at specialists, some of them, like today's talk, are also of more general interest. So I'd urge you, you know, I mean, thanks for coming to this talk, and I'd urge you to come to our other talks. Uh, either you can come online or you can come in person. We have a whole bunch of other ones. We've got one coming up on uh, disinformation. It's really interesting. I mean, we've got all kinds of great stuff, so check it out. So how things are going to work today, basically, um, uh, uh, Dr. Alfred's going to talk to us for about 45 minutes or so, and then we'll have a question and answer session, and we'll try to end more or less around 4.30. So that's our action plan. But before I pass things to uh, Manon Tremblay, uh, uh, Director of Concordia's Office of Indigenous Directions, I, I'd like to say one, one other thing. Uh, when I saw that Tayaki Alfred had his new book out, and with its title, It's All About the Land, I thought right away we needed to invite him as part of these talks. Speaking personally, I've long been a believer that Dr. Alfred's title says it all. It's all about the land. I grew up in Mi'kmaq territory in southwest Nova Scotia. I've seen the fruits of injustice done to the land and to Indigenous people by white society. And regarding that, Dr. Alfred says in his book, he says, quote, having our land back, our laws and institutions and power governing that land is fundamental. I agree with that. And that's one reason why I'm really interested to hear what he has to say to us today. So I'll turn things over to Manon now to give a proper introduction to Dr. Alfred. Thanks very much. Um, so my name is Mano, and I'm the Senior Director, Indigenous Directions here at Concordia. Um, and it's a position that I've held for about four years, but my uh, time at Concordia extends much further than this. Um, in fact, that's when I first started at Concordia in 1995, that's the first time that I met uh, Tayayage. Uh, mm -hmm. We sort of crossed, um, crossed in the door. Um, so, um, yeah, so Tayayage. Ganya Gehaga, philosopher, writer, uh, political strategist, and academic with more than three decades of experience in First Nations governance, politics, cultural restoration, and environmental impact assessment. Um, you know, at the time that I met him in 1995, he was a faculty member here in the Department of Political Science. And on top of all of his teaching and all of his research, he was busy laying down the foundations for what was to become the Odzahakta Student Center uh, today. Um, and I took the reins from him uh, when he went on to do bigger and better things. Um, so Tayage also established the University of Victoria's Indigenous Governance uh, Program. and. Uh, uh, you know, he can be credited for originating and developing the, uh, you know, the, the concept of indigenous resurgence as uh, an, inter an intellectual paradigm. Uh, he left academia to devote himself to working directly with his own people in Ganawagi, as well as with other indigenous peoples at the grassroots level, uh, with the aim of breeding uh, new life into our ancestral visions of uh, nationhood. And I hear you're sort of back in academia. Uh, at uh, our uh, rival institution, uh, McGill. Um, 
So Tai yeah. <laughs> so Tai Yang is a graduate of Loyola High School, um, and he served in the Marine Corps of the United States Army uh, before obtaining his bachelor's degree in history right here at Concordia. So he's alumni, um, and he also holds a master's and PhD from Cornell. Um, he's the author of four books, Hating the Voices of Our Ancestors, A Peace, Power, Righteousness, and Indigenous Manifesto, Wasase, Indigenous Pathways of Action and Freedom, and of course his latest work, which we're here to you know, all hear about. Uh, it's all about the land, collective talks and interviews on Indigenous uh, resurgence. And this new book can be more timely. Now, I know I'm gonna get in trouble for saying this, but as many Canadian universities, including Concordia, have turned their attention to land-based education in ways that are not always thought through um, and that seek to cram our knowledge systems into their colonial frameworks. Um, it's important to remind everyone uh, why land, you know, a ski in my language, um, is everything to us. So, you know, it's our home. So would you please help me give Tayage a warm welcome. Thank you so much, Menno, for that introduction and reminder of uh, the connections we have. And uh, every time that I come to Concordia, I always make a point of kind of going back and reminding myself about uh, the heritage I have uh, with this institution and the history and, and so forth. And uh, it's really good to be here today to to see the faces. I have friends, family, uh, mentors, uh, students, colleagues, friends from a long time ago. So it's really good. It feels really good today to be coming and talking about this new work, which is entirely appropriate because it's kind of a full circle, um, full circle book, because it starts to, I'm sorry, he wanted me to talk into the microphone. And sorry for the people that uh, are online. I, I forgot to talk into the microphone to begin with, but hopefully you caught he caught the beginnings of that, but uh, yeah, it's a it's a full circle uh, journey, really. You know, when you think about what this book represents, um, if you haven't read it yet, or if you haven't scanned it, it's it's really uh, an intellectual journey, uh, working through this idea that became known as what indigenous resurgence is. Like, what is indigenous resurgence? And thinking through the idea of how do we keep pushing forward and keep strengthening the movement for our nationhood and for not only the survival, but the re-empowerment of our people as the original people in our own homelands. And so if there's a theme that runs through all that, um, it's the theme of my own work. And I think that my own life and anybody coming from Gahnawage in the era that I did, and really paying attention to and thinking through what our responsibilities are, it's to make yourself useful in that struggle. And so when people talk about uh, my career and the things that I've done and the, the, the accomplishments and so forth, I always put it in that context. Like it's always an effort to try to find the most impactful space, the most useful role for myself in this struggle of our people to survive in our own homelands and to live by our own culture and our own law. And it's as simple as that, but as complicated as that, because we know that in the, in the colonial environment that we live in, it's, it's a struggle to maintain ourselves. It's a struggle, and it has been a struggle from the, from the period of first contact. And I think about resurgence and this idea of resurgence that I'm trying to talk about and put forward in the book and in the lectures that I give and in the work that I'm doing. And it's really the, the latest elaboration, I think, it's the latest kind of strategic positioning and thinking through this uh, this basic idea of how to survive and how to fight for our survival in the and to do it in an appropriate way that's effective in the context that we live in. And if you go back in time, not only in one person's lifetime, but actually it's not one person's lifetime. It's a, it's a small slice. Hopefully there's a lot more lifetime uh, in this person and, and in the things that I'm going to do and say and the work that I'm going to do. But you push back through time. For our people and you can trace the different strategic positionings and the different identities that came with that and the different forms of movement that that were appropriate at their time and their place and it was when i was thinking about coming here and speaking today um i was reminded of this point 
when uh, the latest news came up in on CBC about the letters of uh, Jean Mans, people have heard about that. They discovered in the archive the letter of Jean Mans, and I got interviewed for French for Radio Canada on that and had something to say. And then I saw the article today uh, in English, and they got it wrong, so I had to say something uh, on Twitter about that, of course. Um, but it it reminded me about how long our people, Kanyagahaga, have been fighting for this place, have been asserting our, ourselves in this place. If you think about it, all the way back, and I was going to say, at first, I was going to say 1609, which was the point of first contact between our people and the French. And I, I used to start the story there, but I'm going to go back even further because the work that I've done in recent years with oral histories, archaeology, ethno-history, uh, as part of larger research projects going on in Gahnawage, I, I have to take that story all the way back now because our, our this island of Jochage has stories behind it and it's wrapped up in stories, of course, that, that go far back in time beyond the time of the European. So we have relationships with the uh, Anishinaabeg, the Algonquin Anishinaabeg, there's relationships with the Huron. There's relationships with all kinds of people in our stories. And this place, uh, Jojage, it's a snippet of a word. I have two experts here that are that are my mentors. And so if I get anything wrong, feel free to, to correct me on the fly here. But it's uh, it actually isn't that much of a word in itself. It's a snippet of a longer word. And it's it's a signifier of, of division or, or things separating, right? And that's, that's why people focus on Jojage, because it doesn't actually mean anything in and of itself. It's like separating. Right, and so it could be the mountain, you know, it's it's divided mountain on Onuda Jojage, and in certain maps it was written that way. There's there's the people dividing. It's a, a long word that that word Jojage comes from, but that to me signifies that this place here has been a place of not necessarily contention, but of shared. It's a shared space. It's a, it's a place where people have gone back and forth for many, many years. And I found out recently that the Algonquin Anishinaabeg have a name for this place too. I should have known that a long time ago, but, uh, but I didn't. And as a Mohawk, I guess I never really paid attention to that. But uh, if, are, are there any Algonquins in the room that could tell me uh, authoritatively what the name of this place is? I believe it's Muniang. I got it right. Okay, Muniang. And that, and in the, in the conversations we're having on the ancient peopling of this area, conversations we're having with Algonquin researchers, with people who study that, and people who study our own history, it came, it came to, I came to the realization, which I should have come to a long time ago, that our peoples have these relationships and have uh, developed uh, ceremonies, have developed rituals, have developed languages around those relationships that really defined our ancestors in a certain way in times past, which we now are struggling to reconnect with and, and bring back to a place in our own lives as part of our own identity. And all of this is this process of recovering from the erasure of colonization. So the erasure, cultural erasure of Catholicism, of residential schools, of just modern society and what it did to our people and the dispersal of our people to the idea of what it was to be Ganyagahaga or Ungwe Hunwe when I grew up. And I understand from talking to my my elders here, even when they grew up, the, the consciousness of being a ongoing Hongwe person just wasn't the same way that it is today. So we are in a process of massive recovery, not only in terms of our attachment to a place and our attachment to what it is that makes us up, but the relationships, the good relationships, the positive relationships, the mutual, the mutually supportive relationships that we had with our other ongoing Hongwe brothers and sisters in this area too. And all of this is this process of, of recovery. But it came about when thinking about Jean Mans and the letters, because, you know, when we talk about the timing and so forth, I, I thought about it and I'm like, wow, even in, even in 1653, when this letter was written, I believe, you know, they, they were talking about the, the Iroquois, the Mohawk people being around every corner. And of course, I, I think she was asking for support or money when she wrote that letter from France. So I always take a grain of salt and put it on the letter when I'm reading about it in terms of just how the veracity, you know, of what she was saying. But I think it's it's reflected in a lot of other different letters and a lot of other different sources that are available from the time where the Ganyakahaga people were asserting their sovereignty and ownership over this island and this land 
1653, in 1640. In 1609, the reason there was a conflict between the Ganyagahaga and the French and their Algonquin allies at the time is because they were coming up to this island to, and it's kind of lost uh, in the oral history and so forth as to why, but they were coming up in force from the villages they were living in at the time. And they met around Schenectady, no, not Schenectady, Ticonderoga. They met around Ticonderoga. And the initial, the initial relationship began then. Unfortunately, it was a relationship where it began with the French Champlain using his guns to kill our war chiefs. And that was the start of that relationship. And so you could see how the relationship was colored uh, by a certain event and how that carried through and rippled through history and created a relationship and an idea of what the Haudenosaunee were, what the Iroquois were, what the Mohawk were in the French consciousness developing from that because of the wars and the pushback and, and so forth. But it's been only very recently in this society here where people have come to accept the fact that the Ganyakahaga are have a place here that is not a place of, believe it or not, uh, some of the younger people might be shocked here, but a place of immigration. Of, of being immigrants to this hand, land led by the Jesuits by the hand to come and settle from their original homelands in another part of North America, being central New York and so forth. You know, the, the efforts that our people have had to establish themselves here and to survive culturally and politically in this land is the movement that we are all part of here today. This is, this is the movement when we talk about Mohawk nationhood, when we talk about what what nationalism is to Mohawk people, when we talk about what our movement is, as Ongwehunwe, we're talking about that reestablishment of our people in our homeland and the reestablishment of, of the respect for our sovereignty and our nationhood and our, and our right to be here. Because Mohawk people, for as strong as we are, we were pushed out of the consciousness, we were pushed out legally, we were pushed out physically from, our, from an area of the world that we had been established in for, for millennia. And so whenever I come to talk in Montreal, I spend some time, maybe too much time, talking about the root of that and wanting people to acknowledge that. And it's only very recently that that society has come around to, to accept that. And that's, that's beginning to re be reflected in some ways that are very um, noticeable. You look at the flag of Montreal today, if someone's not looked at it recently, have a look at the flag of Montreal. But a few years ago, it got changed and the, the tree of peace now is in the middle. So it's not only the British and the French uh, insignias and coat of arms that make up the flag of Montreal. There's also, there's also the Tree of Peace, uh, a recognition of that. We're doing work with museums in Montreal. We're doing work with the Université de Montréal. There's a big research project that's, that's developing and will hopefully be funded and taking place over the next seven years involving all of these universities, Concordia, McGill, uh, University de Montréal, the various museums and so forth, which really, which really integrate the idea of the Ganyak Gahaga being of this land. And so when, when, I, when I think about it's all about the land for us, it, it really is about that restoration of our existence and, and respect for us as, as the original people of this land. And so it seems like from the time I first started teaching at Concordia, from the time I first started doing this type of work, both as a learner and then sharing the knowledge, it's been about that process of coming to understand my responsibilities as Ongwehua in that larger struggle, because I think about it in ancestral terms. So a land acknowledgement for me is really thanking my ancestors for what they did, how they fought and survived, so that I could be standing up here today in 2024 as a, as a Ganyak Gahaga, still here, but also conscious of myself as a Ganyak Gahaga and asserting the rightness of our nation's place over here on this land. And so the land acknowledgement goes far beyond uh, any type of surface issue. And it's kind of, and it's for us, it's, a, it's an acknowledgement of that spiritual connection that we have to this place. It's a spiritual connection. And we did not have that for so long. We did not have that. Our, our spirit was confused collectively, if I can say that. I'm, I'm kind of thinking about how to express it. Uh, as I'm standing up here, but our spirit as a result of colonization was not connected. Colonization, and, and this is a theme in the book that runs throughout many of the presentations that I've made, colonization is fundamentally an effort to disconnect 
the Ongwe Hunwe from the true sources of their identity, their being, and of, and of who they are. And a very effective job was done. A very effective job was done across the land, across the, the hemisphere, basically. But I know it from my own experience. I've been around the world. I've, I've talked to a lot of different people. I had students from many different nations. But as Manon uh, said in the introduction, I've kind of come home, and, and I'm focusing now on myself as a Ngwehue and a Ganyalkahaga. And I know how a colonization disconnected us from ourselves and disconnected us from each other. We're still trying to confront that in the work that we're doing in this community, even in spite of years now, generations now of work on language and cultural restoration, bringing back traditions of government, uh, working on, on ceremony and restoring that spirit and restoring the fire of our existence. We're still dealing with the colonial legacies of mistrust, of mistrust of each other, of mistrust of institutions, and, and sadly, mistrust of ourselves and fear moving forward into in, in stepping into that space of our true existence. We're still dealing with all of that, but that is the struggle that we're committing ourselves to, to work through that, to, to, have, to have the recognition of ourselves as being shaped by colonization, as carrying that, that colonial burden of, of wearing those scars, of acknowledging the gaps uh, and not having what we need to have, but also committing ourselves to the work and the struggle to restore those things, to restore that connection, to restore our knowledge of ourselves in this place, to restore the strength that we gain physically from the medicines, from the actual substance, the natural environment, and then also restore the strength of our people for having done that as a nation of people living in this territory. Decolonization is really that restoration of connection. And that's why I started off talking about it's not only connection of one person to a particular piece of land, it's connection amongst themselves as a nation, but having positive connections and relationships with everyone around us. We're not the savages running around in the forest killing each other over beaver tails. Uh, just because we can get a better price. We didn't wipe out the Hurons just to get more money, as the history books tell us that we did. If you read about the history of this country, it's all about the Haudenosaunee being the boogeymen and the Hurons being the poor victims and all motivated by European ideas about value and money and place in this economic context and so forth. No, there was, there was, there was things that happened in our lives which created uh motivations that were rooted in our disconnection from ourselves because of the coming of a different way of thinking about responsibility different way of thinking about relationship christianity catholicism european values and sure there was rivalry and contest on the economic plane but fundamentally it was a spiritual crisis for our people and that spiritual crisis was manifested in the things that people observed us of doing but it was not anything other and more fundamental than a disconnection from that true source of who we are, the land. And I have experienced this like every other Indigenous person. I've thought about it. I've read about it. I've tried to think through it. Um, the reason this book is titled It's All About the Land is because someone, and I've said this in a, in a couple of the other book presentations I've done, um, someone articulated it very, very clearly to me at an early stage of my own learning. And it wasn't at Concordia, it was at the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples in Ottawa as a young researcher, actually while I was a professor here when I was starting out. I also worked at the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples. And uh, for those of you that don't know what the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples was, it was a, a large scale uh, endeavor uh, funded by the Canadian government from 1992 to 1996 to try to, f basically to try to figure out the Indian problem. <laughs> Uh, which is basically to say, what can we do as a country that doesn't involve sending the army to Ganawage and, uh, and Ganasadage? Because in 1990, everybody I think here knows there was that militarized conflict in our community. There was a, there was a violent uh, altercation that lasted three months, but really had been uh, a decade or so or more uh, coming uh, in that community. And the Canadian government um, for whatever reason, I'm not party to the, the, the reasonings that they had for this. I suspect it was because uh, 
suppressing uh, a native rebellion with force was very expensive and cost a lot of political capital as well. They tried to figure out a different strategy. Let's give them the benefit of the doubt. They did not want that to happen again. They wanted to think through this rather than to, to have an ongoing series of, of, of conflicts. And the Royal Commission brought together basically everyone who was thinking and working on this issue in Canada at the time. If you were a young researcher, you would go to a conference or you'd come to a presentation like this and someone from the Royal Commission would say, hey, Jeremy, you wanna make some coin? You know, you wanna come do some research for us? Yeah, okay. Uh, Manon, you have experience here, you know, sign you up. Everybody was working on that. And the objective was to think through this, think through these problems. And um, long story short is I got caught up in that myself too, as, as a lot of people did. One of the people that was the most influential for me at the time was a person named Rosalie Tizia. She's from Old Crow in the Yukon. And she was a, a person that had a, a great deal of experience, um, land-based life, had gained a lot of knowledge and experience uh, and thinking through these things from her elders and so forth. She also had a lot of connections uh, with influential people in, in Canadian culture, uh, filmmakers, authors, and so forth. And so uh, one of the things that, that she used to do for us young research was to ho young researchers was to host dinners. Um, think about the environment at the time. You know, it's a very patriarchal, white power environment in Ottawa where they're trying to think through these problems and trying to put forward policy statements and so forth and kind of harvesting the knowledge from all of us young researchers. And so you go to meetings and they're just picking your brain literally like, oh, you got that idea, boom, boom. And it was, it was a bit of a stressful environment to go into, but she would host these events that would bring us back, bring us back to ourselves that connection again. It wasn't just an office environment. It wasn't high, high, high pressure meetings in, with people with suits and debates and arguments and so forth. So she'd have caribou or she'd have salmon or something like that and she'd have us over. And uh, we would talk through these things and she would do that kind of cultural grounding again. And one of the phrases, I, I could go on and on uh, about her and the influence, but one of the phrases that she always had was, uh, it's all about the land. So I freely admit, I, I took that from her. I, I hope it was a gift and I didn't steal it from her. <laughs> I think it was a gift. Um, it's all about the land. And it showed me over time that as I became an educator and as I got older, how influential one person can be in a mentoring role. I thought about this phrase, it's all about the land almost every day since then. And this was in 1992 and what is it, 2024 now? <laughs> So almost every day I think about it. And that, the way that she talked about it, the way she put it, uh, it just continues to resonate in, in my head. And I think that's because it was an effective communication of a, of a, of a key point, but it also resonated with, with the experience of, of myself as an Indigenous person. I might not have realized at the time it's all about the land. And, I, and I'm, I'm focusing on this because there's other things that it could be all about. Right, so it's all about the land. Someone asked me when I was doing another book talk, well, what's it? You say, it's all about the land. What's it? I'm like, well, let's get to talking about that one. But it is basically what you're doing. It, what is the purpose? What is your purpose? What is your responsibility? What is your passion? What is your dedication? What is the point? Why are you doing this? And this, discussion and the point that she was making about it's all about the land was in a context where people were arguing and trying i think in hindsight to convince us young researchers that would go on to become professors and policy people and leaders in our communities that in fact it was about self-government or it was about economic development or it was about integration into the, the larger society on a fair basis there are a lot of different things it could be assimilation, integration, if you want to call it, reconciliation, to, to start talking about that, um, social, economic justice, um, all kinds of things. And so we got to talking, and, and her point, to get back to it, is always was always that any one of those things is okay and good, and keep, we can work on those, as long as you don't forget that it's all about the land and our connection to the land. If it's not bringing us back to the land in a spiritual, cultural, political sense, if we're not getting our land back in, in all facets of that word, 
it's it's benefiting them and not us. So you all have to remember that it's all about the land. So if you can rationalize what you're doing as leading to at some point to your own people being living the next generations of your people, the faces that are yet to emerge from the earth in the next few generations in your community, in your nation, having the ability more than you have to live on their land by their law, living out their culture and their value system, then you're doing something good. If they're going to have less of an ability than you to do that, you're actually taking those generations and putting them in the hands of the colonizer. You're, you're making them, you're giving them a future that is colonial, not reflective of the ancestral vision that our people had. And that's where a lot of people at the time, and still I think today, kind of get, get caught intellectually, because there's a lot of incentives, there's a lot of logical reasons for wanting to have a future for your children and grandchildren that is comf more comfortable that is easier, that fit where they fit in more. They're not targeted by racism. They're, they're not picked on. They, they just fit into that society. There's, there's, a lot of, there's logical reasons for that, for wanting to do that, and you could see that. But the point of the discussions that we were having, and, and this is another point in this book here, in many different ways making this point, is that that is not the ancestral vision of survival that we have a responsibility as Ungwehue with names like the Ayayage, that names that names that we inherit, clan responsibilities that we inherit, family responsibilities that we inherit. That's not our responsibility. Our responsibility is to respect that ancestral vision, to honor the struggle of our ancestors, and to carry that struggle forward. If both can be done, fantastic. But I think the analysis in this book and a lot of our analysis is that it's very difficult to justify doing both of them at the same time. We still live in a society where the commitment has to be weighted towards doing the, the type of things that reattach us to our land. And that's where the idea of resurgence comes in. When we first started talking about this, I have a couple of former students in the in the room here, I'm proud to say. But even before they showed up in, in uh, IGOV, a long time ago, we started talking about this and trying to think through this, this uh, conflict that, that we find ourselves in. Even, even if we do come to the point where we're healed enough, we're strong enough, we have enough personal power, we have support, we have access to institutions where, that respect us and we can think and work and so forth. We're still in a conflict situation about where where do we go, you know, and, and, and what, what do we do? So thinking through this, I kind of articulated that there's three basic approaches to decolonization. Let me phrase it that way. So if this whole thing is decolonization as a response to colonization, and this is all subject to debate, of course, right? This is my perspective on it and what I've written about in this book here and talked about for a long time. There's three basic approaches, and that's one of the essays, too. I keep trying to tick off essays in the book with these points here. So one of the essays in the book talks about the three R's, and I know David likes this one, so I'll talk about this one for a few minutes. The three R's, it's not reading, writing, arithmetic. It's, uh, it's resistance, reconciliation, and resurgence. And when I started taking the knowledge that I had been given as a result of my work with the Royal Commission, starting to think about the teachings that I was, was exposed to and which were my responsibility to learn as Ongwehunwe through the teachers that I, had, that I had been coming into contact from and started listening to and learning from, I started to think about, okay, well, how do I formulate a vision? Because now I'm not, I'm not I'm at, the, at that point in my life, it was 2000s, 2005, I'm not a learner anymore, okay? I, we're always learning, by the way. I, it's a lifelong thing, I believe in that, but, I have also a responsibility now to not only learn, but to share. I'm a professor. I'm, I'm getting paid. Uh, I'm, I'm of an age where people are starting to ask me questions and so forth now, and I'm, I'm along that road that people are, are just starting. So I have responsibility, and I start thinking about that. Okay, well, what do I have to share? How do I frame it? And so resistance was no problem coming from Ganawage. <laughs> you know, I, I understood what resistance was. Look at the title uh, of the book, you know, the flag there. 
uh, it's a symbol. And it's still a very powerful symbol that, it, that, that evokes a lot of emotion one way or another from a lot of our people, a lot of pride, a lot of fear, depending on how you experienced the movement in the 70s and the 80s and so forth. But resistance in our community was something that was one of the first instincts that our people expressed and one of the first strategic visions that our people implemented. And, and I, I could say the 1970s and 80s with the Red Power Movement, the Warrior Society, the, the militancy of, a, of the Longhouse Movement in our communities and so forth, uh, and since then, but I'll, I'll go all the way back even. I mean, resistance is also in 1609, them coming up to defend uh, the island of Montreal from an invading force. It's the 1640s trying to burn down the hospital here. Sorry, uh, <laughs> Quebecois, but you know, that there was an invading force into our territory and they did what they needed to do at the time. And that went on for from 1609 all the way till the peace of 1667. Not that it was a, a long standing perfect peace, but our nation made peace with the French in 1667. The other Haudenosaunee had already done so in uh, between 1640s and 1660. So that was a long time of pushing back, a long time of trying to eradicate that force which was invading our territory. You think about wars that go on from for almost 80 years. You know, it's a long time to be uh, on that footing. And so our nation is no slouch when it comes historically to resistance. We've put up fights, we've pushed back, we've organized to fight. So when we think about resistance, it's organizing to fight off an aggressor. The problem with resistance, as we found, which most people in the world have found as well, is, and, and I go through all of this in my book, Wasaze. I spent a lot of time of thinking through this in Wasaze. The problem with resistance, whether it's effective or not at pushing back, it transforms you and uh, it transforms the character of your community. And it transforms the character of the relationships that you have with other people because you're on a war footing. You're, you're organizing to fight. And I think that we're coming to grips in Gahnawage now trying to move away from the colonial apparatus that we have for governance to talk about what traditional governance is. We're finding that we're, we're running into obstacles where people's character, people's psychology, people's way of being and even thinking about what it is to be Ongwehunwe is structured on that fight mode. So we're always in, we're always in uh, resistance mode. And it's, you can't dismiss it because it was necessary. We needed to fight to protect ourselves. We needed to do that. But we also have to recognize that being in resistance mode has a, has a he, you pay a heavy cost as a community for doing that. And you have to think beyond that because you have to be able to resist, but you also have to be able to live with sensitivity, with comfort, with safety, with joy, all these types of things. That has to happen too. And those were in very short supply <laughs> uh, in our communities at various times and still are sadly in a lot of communities because whether it's a community collective or whether it's a family or an individual person in that resistance mode, they're fighting for survival. And so when we start thinking about this and putting together a vision forward for Ongwen Hue in, in the early 2000s and so forth, we acknowledge the power of resistance, the necessity of it, but also acknowledge that we need to think beyond it. We need to think about a different way as well, or at least having a different set of capacities in our community and in, in, in ourselves to be able to operate in a different way when the barbarian was not at the gate, to use that phrase. Kanawagi is very good. We remind ourselves when there are threats at the gate, we do organize, we come together, we fight. But it seems like that's the only time we come together, sadly, is when someone's attacking us. That's changing, but historically, that's the way it is. So now we think about, well, what's the alternative? And at this period of time in the 2000, 2005, 2010, moving forward, the alternative was reconciliation, right? The reconciliation, which to me, I'm using it, <clears throat> it's, a, it's a huge topic. Of course, I acknowledge that. There's all kinds of things that are part and parcel of this idea of the era of reconciliation and so forth. But it was basically about forgiving ourselves, forgiving the society, healing, reconstructing our societies on the basis of care, safety, and so forth. This whole, this whole idea that's kind of like the opposite of, of resistance. It's the opposite of being on that war footing. You're wanting to recreate a relationship where you can actually be at peace. 
And that's the good part about reconciliation is so there's there's acknowledgement, there's the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which is basically all about acknowledging the harms of the past, committing to do better together, forgiveness, and moving forward and building uh, a better society or a better relationship. I, I realize I'm grossly simplifying what reconciliation is, but I think that's the heart of it. <clears throat> and at first, people were excited about that. People were embracing that idea. Reconciliation. Who's going to argue with that? Who's going to argue with the fact that we can we can shake hands, we can be friends, and we can all get along going together in a society that's not overtly racist or targeting indigenous peoples or, or doing all of the negative things that were done in the past. But where this idea of resurgence comes in is that just as problematic as, as resistance is, and just as necessary as resistance is, but yet problematic, same thing when it comes to reconciliation. Just as necessary as it, it is to desire peace, to desire a good relationship, the problematic aspect is that people are manipulating that concept in order to remain rooted in their colonial privilege. So reconciliation over time, from the time it was first proposed until now, I would argue, is more about white people feeling better about themselves than doing anything substantially good for indigenous people. That's reconciliation. I think indigenous people in the room, who in the room, I think there's a consensus that that is what the end effect so far has been in terms of reconciliation even the, the the calls to action that uh and i'm not impugning the motives or the intelligence or the character of uh, justice sinclair at all i think he tried to do a great a good job and he did a good job in terms of what he he was mandated to do but if you think about what the calls to action are coming out of the trc they're all about taking the sharp edges off racism in the society taking the taking the harmful words the trigger points opening up access for people to come where they had doors shut in their face before changing the most obvious surface level reminders that canada is built on stolen land that our traditional governments are not recognized that all of these bad things happen that really canada could not would not exist except in a framework of theft of mohawk land and every other nation's land in this territory and the failure to have a serious effort to redress that. Because reconciliation has nothing to do with land. Those calls to action don't mention land once. They don't mention the restoration of our traditional government once. They're all about making Canadians and Canadian society more palatable to those that operate within it. And again, good objective. Everybody wants to see that, but at what cost? So the same kind of dyna dynamic that's at play with resistance, there's a cost, so it's not acceptable. Well, there's an objective here that's, that's uh, honorable, but it's not acceptable now because the cost. Leaving your land claims behind, leaving your, your traditional law behind, leaving your traditional identity, your responsibilities as Ongwehunwe behind in order to make friends and be at peace with the larger society, that's not acceptable. The whole, the whole idea of reconciliation is founded on the idea of a creation of a facsimile of what it is to be Ongwehunwe that suits white society and asking us to buy into that and to live that out. And the facsimile is only expansive enough to the, to the point where it only gets as big and deep and, and means as much until it starts impacting on the privileges of the larger society. Where the privileges gained from colonialism of that larger society start to get frustrated, that's where reconciliation ends. And that's where that facsimile ends. And I use the word of facsimile because it's created artificially by people who are not us. Yes, there are some people that are indigenous that participate in the creation of the idea of Aboriginal rights and title. We all do, who go to university, we take courses, we do this, some of us are professors and so forth. But the idea of Aboriginal rights and title and the recognition of what it is to have an Aboriginal right in Canada is not the creation of, of a native elder rooted in native spirituality, expressing full on native thinking. It's a moderated compromise between that and the interests of Canadian society. Granted, everybody is in the game knows that. 
But what results from that is not true indigenous philosophy. It's not true indigenous rights. It's that moderated compromise. Same thing on almost every aspect of identity. And that's not only law, it's what it is to be in this society, how you are expected to live that out. It's all these negotiated compromises. And so if it had worked out over the last 30 years where anybody who comes from an indigenous culture and community could feel comfortable operating in that context saying, I can express myself fully as a, as a Ganyankahaga person, as a Cree person, as a Niska person, I can, I can express myself fully and that's respected and accommodated. And it's not. And so there's problems there. That's where this idea of resurgence comes from. The idea of resurgence comes from an analysis of looking at this end, <laughs> resistance, fighting, and this end, compromise, in order to achieve friendly relations, and says, well, we don't like either one. Either way, the next generation is lesser native. Either way, three or four generations down the road, they're not even going to exist anymore in the ancestral vision, that facsimile is gonna take over. And they're, they're gonna to have to be some sort of a, a remnant of what it was to be Ungwehue in the ancestral vision. And we're not ready to give up that fight yet. We're not, we're not ready yet, hopefully never ready, but we're still willing to fight and dedicate ourselves to that ancestral vision. That's where resurgence comes from and it says, okay, what are we gonna do about it? And this book, this book gets to, I'm so focused, I can talk right through that. <laughs> this book gets to the heart of the matter about what, is the, what, what do we need to do today in order to make sure that we don't fall into either one of those traps and that we're effective in creating a future. For our, and the answer, short, the short answer, because I know I've been talking for a while now and there's probably questions and people want to have a discussion, but the short answer that comes through in this book is that we need to build a foundation for a political movement, but we need to start with the foundation of restoring our connection to our land, restoring our languages, restoring our culture, rooting our children in that culture, giving them the, the power to organize on that basis in order to confront the political forces which keep us colonized and force us into the, the reconciliation framework that is the facsimile and refuse to accept our true reality as Ungwe Hunwe. And it was a theory for a while, but I think in the last few years, people have taken this idea of resurgence in academia, in land-based uh, programs, inside nations, even in law. Um, people have taken it and started to try to find a way to see through the smokescreen that reconciliation is for colonialism. Because that's another image I think that is entirely true and accurate, is that recolonization of our people is happening and reconciliation is the smokescreen to blind us to that reality. But people are starting to see through it now because they're starting to learn their languages. They're starting to commit to learning the philosophies. They're bringing back that community-based power they're restoring their land-based responsibilities. And from that perspective, they're standing and looking at the reality in a different way. And they're seeing it rather than standing inside this, this, this colonial force and not recognizing what's happening. They're stepping out and they're seeing it for what it is. And then they're starting to develop strategies, movements, organizations to move in the direction of confronting that. And not all of them are confrontationalist. Some of them are more generative in trying to develop from within and give people a, just a different perspective. But there is a political and legal movement as well to challenge um, that's based on this, this stronger foundation. I always use the image, um, and it's another, uh, I, I forget which essay I was gonna say, which it's in this one particular essay, but it is in the book where I talk about how to think about this restoration of this cultural foundation so for my, myself and in our culture, it's not my own personal name. Like it wasn't made up for me. It's, a, it's an ancient name. It comes through my family. And I'm the, I'm the latest one to carry that name. 
right? And I think about my responsibilities. I'm educated about my responsibilities in large part too through that name, you know, it's in the set of responsibilities you have. But I think about it oftentimes and I'll share it with you too. It's like, how am I carrying that name in 2024 as the Tayage alive today versus 400 years ago and the, the man who was carrying that name then? You think about the comparison there, and that's that's colonization. The fact that I'm not a fluent language speaker, I had to learn in my 20s and 30s a lot of the laws and our, uh, our traditional culture. Um, I had to learn basically what it was to carry the responsibilities and what those responsibilities were as an adult, as many of us, uh, as Ongwen Hawaii people. So if I think about the cultural foundation that I'm standing on, it's kind of like a little rock <laughs> about, you know, I feel confident. I'm not, it's not Taiyage in uh, 1981 carrying a machine gun for, for capitalism in the Marine Corps. Certainly things have changed from then, but it's still pretty, pretty small compared to that foundation that, that Taiyage in uh, 1600 was standing on. You know, that's a, that's a mountain. The knowledge, the words, the perspective, the, the experience. So when I think about cultural restoration, I think about resurgence. It's about, it's about making that foundation bigger. You make a big foundation so that we can all stand at that, on that foundation confidently and assert ourselves in the way that we need to. Just like I started off saying, when we're confronted with a challenge, when we're confronted with people who are trying to destroy our fire, Gawadzure, our fire, when they're trying to make that nothing but embers and stomp it out, as they've done a number of times throughout history, we have to be able to come together and restore the power of that fire and the strength of it and build it back up again. Sometimes that's law. We were, we were yes, we, yesterday, Neil Yerda and I were in a, a session where we're talking about a legal challenge and how we need to come together to assert ourselves in, in law and how the work that we did and Curtis Nelson, a condole chief of the Haudenosaunee, and I was part of this and other people convinced a judge in Quebec Superior Court about how our treaties were real and needed to be respected by the crown and resulted in a big legal victory um, in November for our people. By the way, that's not resolved. The appeal's underway and we'll be going, <laughs> we'll be going back to court on that at least once more. But that just shows you that when you come at colonialism from that resurgent perspective of a strong cultural foundation knowing your responsibilities and restoring the strength of those relationships it can succeed and it can succeed in a way that is actually authentic to what you and your ancestors are fighting for not some sort of compromise solution that's going to take you in an incremental way further and further away from that ancestral vision which we found ourselves in on both ends of those on both ends of that spectrum, you know, becoming just like Maoist rebels, you know, engaging in resistance and, and, and thinking about ourselves in terms of rebellion and taking on the character of, of, a, of, of a rebellion as opposed to a resurgence. And the same thing in terms of reformist instincts, taking on the character of that, of that reformed Canadian society and identity as opposed to who we truly are. And so this book talks about all of that. And there's, there's also uh, a personal element working through it because of course, um, being a human being and doing this type of work and doing it largely in public, like I'm doing now, um, there's an evolution in thinking and there's an evolution in, in the person just by chronology. <laughs> you know, you don't start from 2005 and end up in 2023 when the book was published, the same person. I hope not. You know, you hope people change and you hope people learn and you hope people grow. You take on new knowledge, you, you learn from challenges and so forth. There's also the intellectual evolution. There's also the, um, the, the change in roles and responsibilities over time. And all of this is reflecting. And I hope what it offers people is a chance to see that engaging in this struggle there's an opportunity for not only thinking about what the challenge is and being, being someone who 
is active in that and finding a role for yourself and so forth. But if you find yourself in a position of leadership, there's the opportunity to think and lead and to offer new ideas and to motivate people and inspire people, but also the giant opportunity to look at yourself and be self-reflective and to see like, am I being the most useful person? Am I being the most useful person? What does the nation need from me? What does this next generation need from me? And being able to recognize the need to shift and the need to step out of certain spaces and into other spaces to be more useful and to, to continue to learn and grow as a person. And there's, there's that too. The particular essay of my experience in university and, and so forth is I think uh, illustrative of that intellectual personal journey where the need to continue to be self-aware and reflect on how you are embodying colonial ideas and practices and behaviors and so forth is absolutely essential to remaining relevant to remaining useful you can't just have an idea of what it is to be a leader to have constructed a personality and a set of traits and and, and skills and stand on that for 30 years that may be useful for a period of time but we all know people who do that and they end up off to the sides or problematic and so what this book is arguing for too is full engagement full full honesty and authenticity and engaging in those relationships accountability and looking at who you are and what you are and then moving forward and learning from that and continue to try to find a place with a good heart and a good mind for how can i remain useful and how can i remain respectful to the values and the expectations of not only my ancestors but of the community that i'm working within so this book touches a lot of issues and uh i'm very very honored that you would all come uh to hear me talk about it and i'm looking forward to hearing uh questions or comments that anybody has on anything that I've said or anything that I haven't said that's in the book that you might want to talk about. So, Donato, you all go. Yes, sir. Yeah. Go on, Yeah. Um, two questions. Okay. Well, can you come up to the mic there? And uh, I think it's a call that'd be great. Everybody, when you pose the question, just come up to the mic because we want to capture what you have to say on Zoom. But, um, could you help us better understand the impact of the uh, Montour White decision regarding precisely resurgence that you spoke about? Mm. And perhaps you might want to link it to resistance as well. Mm. Right. That's the first part of the question. The second one is the larger question in terms of, you know, you're talking about standing on a small rock, whereas your ancestors stood on a mountain of mm -hmm. knowledge and also different alliances among Onkwehoe peoples, mm -hmm. you know. At this time, where Onkwehoe and particularly the Ganegayoro, they're seeking to defend and to emphasize their culture, how do the different nations work together to have a kind of a bargaining power, a political power in respect to the colonial government out of Ottawa or Quebec City? Mm. So those are my two questions. I <laughs> know, big questions. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so on the first, the first is actually, uh, I think, easier right off the top of my mind. Um, I have a PowerPoint that I could share with you, <laughs> that, that I could share with you on that, which I, I kind of worked through yesterday in two presentations that I did on exactly that. Um, the White and Montour case, for those of you that are not familiar, you can Google it, but I'll give you the one minute version here. Um, as many of you or most of you might know, uh, one of the main economic engines in Gahnawaga and the Haudenosaunee communities over the last 40 years has been uh, tobacco trade. So uh, legally or illegally or uh, in gray area, importing tobacco from the United States and processing it at first just selling it uh and then and then eventually and now processing it for sale uh all across the country uh it was criminalized it was illegal and uh uh the court case revolves around the 2001 excise act so canada passed the 2000 an excise act in 2001 where uh 
uh, unless you pay duties on imported tobacco, uh, you were committing a crime. And so everyone in Ganawage does not pay duties. <laughs> Nobody involved in this industry pays duties. Uh, actually, sorry, there are some people that have gotten Quebec licenses and so forth, but the bulk of the people who are involved in the industry uh, do not pay. So there was, there was a huge operation to make the long story short. Two individuals were arrested among a number of individuals and they refused to plead. They uh, pled not guilty. They did not plead guilty. They challenged it and they went to court in 2016. 2018, they were convicted on uh, federal charges uh, related to the Excise Act. They were, they were um, exonerated on provincial charges of the best crime name ever, gangsterism. So they were, yeah, that's the crime. Uh, they, they, were, they got off on that. And so they were convicted of, uh, of avoiding the excise tax, not paying it. And so they launched a constitutional challenge saying that that act, uh, Canada did not have the authority and the right legally, constitutionally to impose that on Mohawks. The argument being that we had a pre-existing treaty relationship as Haudenosaunee people with the crown and that anything to do with the regulation of trade between our peoples had to be negotiated through the covenant chain relationship. The covenant chain was the, the name of the whole series of treaties, the, the imagery and the idea of, of, a, of a relationship based on the two-row wampum, basically the philosophy of the two-row wampum. So this was the argument that was made so that they did not go through the, the covenant chain. They did not respect live treaties and therefore the application was unjust and therefore they didn't commit a criminal act. That's what the court case was about. Simply put, the court case involved um, the defendants who by now were the appellants because uh, they were convicted and they launched the constitutional challenge. And so uh, they had a number of witnesses. I was one of them. Um, they had a historian from Cornell University. They had the Dean of Law from Queens University and they had one of our community uh, elders and leaders, Peggy Mayo. So basically we argued what we just asserted, that there was a, a number of treaties that we had, that the Crown always recognized Mohawk sovereignty. Part of those treaties were the fact that we have free trade, that we would never agreed to be regulated uh, by the Crown, and that the covenant chain was explicit in saying that anything that need, that, that's done in this regard has to be negotiated. Um, the Mohawk Nation Council Chiefs, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, uh, intervened in the uh, constitutional challenge and said very clearly that the Ganawage Mohawks were part, part of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy as of 1760 because there's all this history that's very complicated of us being in and out and people debate whether or not Ganawage was an independent community, Haudenosaunee community, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, they said in 1760, at least we were part of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy and we are today. And the Haudenosaunee uh, Confederacy is party to this covenant chain, and therefore the Mohawks of Ganawage and people who exercise those rights under that authority are not subject to the Excise Act. And in a stunning, <laughs> stunning legal decision in November of this past year, Justice Sophie Bork of the Quebec uh, Superior Court, for the first time in history, I believe, agreed 100% with what the Native said. <laughs> and disagreed 100% with what the Crown said. I think it's the only case, all the legal historians, if there's any in the crowd can correct me if I'm wrong, but it was shocking. It, it, was, it was shocking for the lawyers, it was shocking for the legal community in Canada, certainly shocking for us who, who were part of it, to have a judge have listened. And I'm kind of being a bit flippant here, but it was shocking and emotional. People cried when they read the decision. People cried in the room when she read the decision and the, the summary of it, because for the first time in, in history of Canada, a person of authority in a white power structure listened and heard and understood. She, she recited back our traditional government, our laws, our treaty history, just as good as anyone I've ever heard talk about that. She really listened. She really understood. She learned from Curtis Nelson. She learned from all of the people who spoke. 
Dr. Amber Adams, I have to say, is a, a scholar out of Six Nations. She also wrote a paper that educated about the, the workings of the Confederacy. And 175 pages of the judgment, it's 440 pages. 175 pages, the first part of it is basically educating people on the heritage, the history, the language, the meaning of what it is to be in a relationship. And how when you make a commitment in the Haudenosaunee perspective, you can't just walk away from it. A treaty is not invalid because one party says that they don't want to they don't want to adhere to it anymore. Those obligations still exist and you can be held accountable to those obligations. Massive change, massive challenge, massive threat that this decision presents to the Canadian establishment and, and status quo. She also went much further. She didn't only let them off. She didn't only validate our treaty history. She said reconciliation as it's currently constructed is, is racist and completely uh, insufficient. We need to recognize the sovereignty of the First Nations. Reconciliation is not accommodation. It's recognition, the sovereignty of First Nations. She said that the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People is not an aspirational document. It is binding human rights law that now forms the floor of the interpretation of Aboriginal rights in Canada. She said the Van Der Peet test for whether or not someone has an Aboriginal right in Canada, which by the way is this kind of frozen in time, you can only do things that your ancestors did in the way they did it kind of, she said that's racist and obsolete. And here's a new test for Aboriginal rights. That test is basically, is it something that exists in the traditional culture? Is it governed through traditional law? And are the people charged doing that thing? Completely different, throws out Vanderpeet, throws out basically the Canadian government's obstacle to native people modernizing their economy in fisheries, in forestry, all across the board. So it was a, it was a groundbreaking decision that she put forward on her last day as a judge. <laughs> She retired. Smart move. <laughs> <laughs> because now the next the next step is an appeal. And we're getting into a legal talk here, legal process, but indulge me for one more minute here. Very smart because now, even if the appeals court disagrees with her and finds fault in her reasoning and logic and so forth and, and strikes down, how are they going to get another judge? to understand the facts of the case to fairly sentence or to fairly pronounce on it. It puts the, it puts the court in, and it puts the crown in a very difficult uh, position here. So great job, Sophie Bork, uh, in doing that. And that to me, this brings it all around to resurgence because I think that person had no experience with, ab with Aboriginal rights, no experience with native history, did not know the first thing. Aside from sentencing, I think in the past, some Mohawks uh, under the Excise Act, I think she had uh, sentenced people who had pled, you know. Um, so she didn't have any special knowledge. She's a, a Quebecois, grew up here, a Superior Court judge, and then had to learn from, from square one. This is what Hongwe Hongwe means. This is what our history is. And to me, the approach we took is resurgence. You know, we didn't. I'm, I'm not representing, and I was not representing the Mohawk Nation Council of Chiefs, that was for other people to do it, but I was representing Ganawage perspective. And everything I talked about in terms of rooting ourselves in our own history and culture and asserting, not buying into other ideas about who we are and so forth, we put that forward very, very strongly. The Crown, provincial and federal Crown, argued all kinds of archaic ideas and obsolete concepts about who we are created in that other, that other realm by scholars from another era with a different perspective and so forth. And so it was validating as hell to have a judge with no experience, just sit there and listen to both sides, read all the material, read all the material and say, you guys are full of it. That is complete, completely wrong. And you guys are completely right. So that's, that's I think the lesson I took about from it is that look at the strength, the persuasive strength the ability to convince and educate and make change, this is, now, this is now a serious thing. Like whether or not you like the individuals in Ganamage, 
who did, the, whether or not you agree with tobacco or, or anything like that, we all have to reconcile. And I had my own reservations even agreeing to be on the team um, because I have problems with tobacco. I don't, I don't smoke and I don't like the promotion of it and so forth. And, um, but we recognize the larger implications of it. And so now it is, it is something that is affecting the collective rights of all of us because it is now a Quebec Superior Court decision affecting Gahnawange. As it goes to the appeal court, for those of you that know the law, to the extent it's validated, it will become Quebec law. When they no doubt appeal it to the Supreme Court of Canada, to the extent it's validated, it will become Canadian law. And so we're all in this now uh, as, as people, and it's one of those fights. And I think that this is something that, to me, I was proud to be, I, I don't think, I know I was proud to be part of it, but I think it's illustrative of the strength of that approach, of not trying to argue from within their system, because we could have took, the lawyers could have took a different approach, eh? took the precedent and took the, the, the Sparrow and the Delgamook tests for this and that, just let all that go and say, no, this is what, this is what our rights are rooted in. This is who we are. And, and we were asking you to recognize that. And she did. So that's how resurgence, I think, fits in that. How, how we all present a united front, when you figure that one out, let me know. <laughs> because uh, uh, being flippant again, but I, I think I know the answer to that, but we're a long ways away. It's uh, when, when the fires of each of our nation are restored, and strong and our people are around those fires and know their own responsibilities and know their own names and languages and so forth then we can reach out and have the kind of relationships that our people had in the past where we took in ceremonies yeah yeah we have ceremonies right that come from other nations we have words we have wasaze we have this that comes from elsewhere that shows that we had good strong positive relations with people before enough to be able to share we had conflicts there's a Mohawk cemetery outside a Listaguj or something like that, you know, where we had battles. Ojibwe's battled the Mohawks here and there and all that. But if you look at history from an objective point of view, you look at thousands of years of interaction. Those those were those were anomalies. You know, every human every human community has eruptions of violence and and so forth. But the the norm is the creation of those peaceful coexistences on a spiritual basis through ceremony. To me, that's it. You know, right now we're trying to, and we've been trying since the 70s to build a united front based on politics, using the political structures in the mentality of the Western government way. So we have the AFN, we have tribal governments, we have band councils, we have all these kind of things. And as much as these people try to do good, you find the limitations of that, right? And so now I think people are starting to realize, and here's where that resurgence comes into, and it's all related to this idea of the rest, of restoring our true selves in, in our true government system to be able to operate from that basis. Just before everybody else walked in, we were talking about uh, something that happened just today uh, in regard to a land claim in Akuzasne. Very contentious uh, tribal government. And uh, up until today, the Mohawk Nation was supporting uh, the resolution of a land claim that a lot of people in the community did not agree with. Um, they found fault in it. They didn't like the process and that and even caused turmoil within the Mohawk Nation Council of Chiefs themselves and so there was a letter put out and the Mohawk Nation has withdrawn so they're not they're no longer supporting that land claim and so it's very unlikely that it's going to proceed unless the St. Regis Mohawk tribe wants to do it all on its own it's very highly unlikely very interestingly in the letter that they wrote it, it really touched my heart because of the work that we're doing in Ganawage too and then just this whole idea of resurgence is they said that we hope that this is the beginning of the movement to restore unity of our people under the great law. So people are thinking on these terms. So they're not looking at the division as a failure, which is why I focused on that. They're like, no, we didn't have, we didn't have consensus. Our system is working. It's, we don't have consensus. We hope that by, by now having to reach out and now having to do the work in the community to restore that consensus on a position that we're going to unify the groups in the community under the under the principles of the great law and that's 
resurgence in a Ganyakahaga perspective. And that's what we're trying to do in the work that we're doing in Ganawage on traditional governance too. If anybody's interested in that, there's a website, kgov.ca, and uh, it, it, it conveys to you the, the initiative that's underway in our community that, uh, that we're, we're part of in, in doing the work to try to move in a very real way. And that's where it is kind of like going back and breathing life into the nationhood from academia, from studying theory and, and writing about it and so forth to actually applying it in Gahnawage, um, we, we actually have, I, I feel, made significant progress in taking the understanding that we have about resurgence and, and putting it back on people in Gahnawage who've been doing that work for generations, but have not connected it to and not connected with each other in a way to be able to make serious transformation of the institutions in that community. And so for me personally, that's what I've been asked to do. And that's that's the role that I'm playing on the ground in that in that community. And hopefully it continues with the, the support <laughs> and uh, the work of, of, of myself and two other people in the room here or on the advisory group. Did I answer your question? Yeah. Can I just say something? Yes, yes. You know, listen, I listen to the point. I thank you for all the work that you do and, you know, all the, the years we've spent talking. You know, and you talked about all this land claim, government approaches in the mind of the colonial governments, Canada, United States, or whoever. You know, and maybe I'm not as eloquent as you, but it's, you know what it reminds me of? It reminds me of about 20 different dogs walking around in our backyard and they're all peeing on our trees. <laughs> and they're saying to us, we're marking our claim. We own this land. And it doesn't matter. The next day they come back and they all pee again on a different tree. And they still own the land, but they didn't get it. It ain't their land. You know, and maybe they will never get it. You know, you... You, you probably wrote about it as well. You know, that doctrine of discovery, that mind that says comes out of there across the ocean, you know, uh, go out onto the world and, and, and claim the earth, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. That mind that man will have dominion over this earth. Mm -hmm. Their man will own their mother. Take what you want from her body. Don't care about her spirit, you know? Mm -hmm. That's that mind of colonialism, right? Or what from, do they call it? Straight from they Genesis. Brought, they brought civilization to us. You know what I say? I believe we were always civilized. And what they brought across the ocean wasn't civilization. It was stuff. It was technology. <laughs> we were civilized before people came across this water. We could talk about any, any, any grass, any root, any tree, and we knew the medicines and the value. We knew how to deal with animals and everything. We were civilized in the way of the earth, you know, and so I just thought I wanted to say that. But there's one one other thing, you know, I think that it's important. Maybe it's a message for your next book. You know, you said it, it, your book says it's all about the land. And one of the things our people need to, we have a message for the everybody around us. huh? In our stories of creation, right, and you know that. When the creator made human beings, he looked, he went to the river and he took the living earth. He made human beings out of the living earth. He gave us his mind. He gave us his fire and it's in our blood today. He breathed into our mouths, our lives. And what's the first instruction he said? He picked up the earth and he says, this earth is your mother. Always love her, care for her. Always give thanks for the life that you live on her. And she will take care of you. She will feed you. She will nurture you. She will give you the medicine you need. And that's the only instruction that the creator ever gave us as people. How do we do that? We sing, we dance, we give thanks. That's our way. And that mother, the earth needs to hear us. People of, when you go and you talk to your governments around you, remind them that. That you can make laws, you can make, you can dig your holes in the earth, take all the minerals from her body. That's her strength. What are we doing to our mother? What is our mother feeling? How many tears does she shed? 
how much pain does she carry? And we need to change the way we live on this earth, our mother. So now I just put on something. Now is it Sakana? Not eloquent at all. <laughs> Thank you, Nyawa. Very eloquent. All right. Not awkward at all. I really don't want to follow those words, but <laughs> I'll try. Uh, I am Quebecois, though not um, proud or national of it, mm. but I did grow up as that during uh, the siege of... Uh, Karasatake. And, you know, I grew up in Quebec, says that they are also colonized, not in the same way. And I definitely saw the racism in my family. I've been walking back and doing the work of uh, disconnecting from that and reconnecting to humanity that we all have. And I found myself, uh, I have an environmental science degree here at Concordia, eventually graduating in May because of a blip, but I'll be good. Um, <laughs> And some of the work or the relationships I've had with Ojibwe, uh, Ganigahaga, and other people have been some of the most privileged I've ever had. I've been invited to ceremony. I've heard uh, the words before all others, Thanksgiving address. And I've been touched by these things and transformed, really. And the work that I try to do is not only reshape the way that uh, settler nations operate in itself, possibly separate from the state or its Western governance, but also, as you mentioned, the Turo Wampum, the covenant chain, rebuilding these relationships. Uh, I was part of a coalition for the energy transition. We were able to put not only UNDRIP in there, but also say that uh, without consent, there was no way to be moving forward without Indigenous nations full consent on projects. Mm -hmm. And when I saw the mention of the uh, White and Montour case, I wonder, and you know, I'd be interested in bringing that to these sort of coalitions, environmental groups that uh, need to understand this relationship that we don't have and you do have with the land. And it's more of, um, I'm gonna say nation to nation relationship, but not in a colonial way. And where we all have to reconnect with our humanity. Ours is different than yours, of course. Mm -hmm. As has been told to me, resistance can be collaborative, but resurgence, we have to do each on our own. And I wonder what you think, even if the appeal changes the decision of it, if uh, the decision itself could be a stepping stone of transformative relationships for all these groups to take to for people like uh, myself, we're at the fault lines between these movements to try and bring these words and show the importance of it, not only for uh, the separate causes that are very solid in academia of climate, of social, of anthropology, but in changing these relationships completely. And I wonder if uh, you've collaborated with settlers mm -hmm. in, you know, trying to have these common but differentiated pathways and not to have all the answers, which I don't expect you to have, but how you see this going forward, possibly. Mm. Well, thanks. Thanks for the question. And thanks for sharing your uh, experience there. My, my short answer is that, yes, I do think that times are changing. You know, when I, um, I think I wrote, it might be in the book here, but I definitely remember, say, in 1999 or something like that. I think I was giving a, a talk in Australia. It was in Melbourne, and I was talking about this, this great divide and on hostility between indigenous rights activists and environmental, the environmental movement. And I was going on and on because it was a reality. I was describing it and I'm like, they don't get it. They don't understand us. They're, col they're colonial in a different way, blah, blah, blah. And uh, uh, a little guy sitting in the front row jumped up and literally attacked me. Uh, and it was Arne Nas. For those of you that know environmental movements, the founder of one of the <laughs> aspects of fundamental aspects of environmentalism, deep uh, ecology. And, and so he, he did, he did get so frustrated, but not, it wasn't with me. He, he was like, stop saying that. You know, he literally came and was like, stop saying that. It's just a little guy. And I was like, okay, okay. Then he said, 
you're right, but it doesn't have to be that way. And a true environmentalist, a true environmentalist understands that indigenous indigenous land is indigenous land and indigenous people have rights on that land and they're they're sovereign peoples and he said that's what we need to integrate into this movement and that's what my my thinking does and that's what environmentalists need to do and for me that was a that was a turning point like it's not it's not us and them it's the fact that that environmental philosophy needs to evolve and develop it, it, it did come out of the instinct of wanting to preserve and have relationships in the natural environment that are respectful and healthy but it was informed by western thinking western philosophy and so forth since then it's been a it's been a big change right i mean a lot of there's been a lot of indigenous philosophical and indigenous influence on environmental thinking and environmental movements that's changed things as it pertains to uh Jochage and this territory we're lagging behind I, I would say you know and that has a lot to do with the relationship politically uh between mohawks and quebec um it has to do with language barriers as well you know having lived and worked in other parts of the country and gone all over the place and i see uh collaborations that develop out of personal commitments and relationships and so forth um work on the ground organizing as you know it takes a lot of effort and intense work and trust trust building it's hard to do that when one partner is unilingual french and the other partner is unilingual english it just it's hard to do that and so that's one thing that we really need to acknowledge and find a way uh, around and i don't think it's going to change like that but it's something that really needs to to be looked at because there's an obstacle there that doesn't need to be there because as i get to know the people who are involved in movements save uh i forget the name is in, in french actually of the mountain the people who care for the mountain here uh they're reaching out to ganawage they want people to come from ganawage and 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 share knowledge and walk and do walks and educate and build start building a say, protect the mountain movement but that language barrier is preventing that from being anything other than a kind of surface level communication so that, i've thought about that quite a bit actually the one area where we did have quite a bit of uh solidarity and action uh was in 2020 when we had the Wet'suwet'en uh solidarity rail blockade you know, we had the Wet'suwet'en Solidarity Rail Blockade in Ganawage and other Mohawk communities, but we had it, it was a focal point in Ganawage. We had that, and people were afraid that it was going to be another 1990, which it could have very well turned into, but it ended up being something quite different um, from having been a young person in 1990, but involved in organizing, I should say, supporting the organizing uh, in that era. And then in 2020, being a runner be between groups and actually involved in organizing it um i saw a great a great deal of shift in what it, the idea of what it is to be in solidarity and work and so some of those relationships had been built some of those relationships were there waiting to be activated so there were groups in the city that took solidarity actions that were consistent with what the people who were involved in the moha community wanted done and so there was there was that to build on um and so that's different though that's exciting that's that's kind of like uh, an adrenaline fueled uh thing that anarchists love and socialists love and mohawks love uh to do and so that brings us together but what about the hard long work and uh the not adrenaline fueled work of saving the trees on mount royal <laughs> or uh are are healing the land in a, in a bigger sense or that's the long-term work that i think we really need to start building uh relationships to do as well and uh i'm optimistic uh myself uh about it because i've seen the change you know i've seen it change from uh the, the 80s till till today and uh just realizing that there's always going to be uh, a lack of human capital and and energy to dedicate to do everything you want to do but i i'm i'm with you like personally i think that this is an important area that we really need to focus on we need to continue to inform with indigenous perspectives that are of this land uh we need to inform the people who are committed to the environment and to restoration and to protection of the, the sacred mountains and so forth and that just hasn't really happened in any any uh extensive way right now but i don't know i'm moving back to Gunawagan next year so maybe we can connect uh when I'm back <laughs> I did get asked to go do a tour uh to collaborate with uh 
an anthropologist from the University of Montreal uh, for the group that's protecting the mountain and wanted to do a walkabout and educate members of the public, something happened and it, and it actually got canceled. But uh, I, I agreed, personally, I agreed that just as an indication of, yeah, that's the kind of thing that I'd like to, to get involved in and continue to work on. Well, folks, I think we have time for uh, one more question. So does somebody want to come up to the mic and uh, ask away? Sorry. <laughs> So um, I'm a child of oil myself. I'm Iranian. So my life, the entire economy of my country and everything that exists there is pretty much in the past 40 years comes from oil. Mm -hmm. But I've also worked with indigenous peoples in the south of Iran who benefit almost no benefit from the oil that is coming from their territories, right? Mm -hmm. And from the waters that are, their, their you know, water territories taken away from them and and I think that um, these talks of resurgence are pretty much limited to settler states mm -hmm. and in other countries where indigenous folks are struggling and are a little bit, they're a little bit, I feel, behind on these sort of, you know, talks and these sort of, this kind of um, vocabulary that mm -hmm. is re-empowering and is sort of uh, capacity building in, in a way, I hate that word, but um, so I, I was just thinking, how would how, how do you see this movement of resurgence in the global level on a global scale, mm -hmm. given that um, conservation movements across the globe are, you know, trying to like limit indigenous, you know, governance over land to protected areas mm -hmm. here, take this piece of land and, you know, here, have your uh, authority over, <laughs> over it here. Right. And I just. I'm thinking, how can we, um, how, how can, do you think it's scalable in a way? Good question. Thank you for that one. Um, it's it's, a, it's a, a difficult question to answer because I've done my research on this. I've tried to, like both in professional terms and as a private person, travel to countries like Colombia and places where it's very, the security situation, is a dangerous situation to be advocating for indigenous rights. You go to Peru, you go to Colombia, you go to Mexico, you start talking about the Hussein. Uh, I haven't been to Iran, um, but I believe there's it's kind of analogous in a certain way in the sense that you have a situation where because of the construction of that state, um, the disciplining of dissent is in a completely different mode than the disciplining of consent here. So you're right, we're, we're free than people in Guatemala, people in Mexico, as indigenous people, people in Iran, to be able to speak and organize and advocate um, for whatever historical reasons that is, or because it's a liberal democracy, who knows? The, 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 the threshold for violence is different, right? And it's there, it's still there, as we found out with the Witsowodan, as people in Ganawaga have found out, there's still a threshold, but we have a lot more range of action to be able to speak and operate and so forth. And I've dealt with that question because I've gone down and been part of conferences and efforts to connect indigenous peoples um, in, in Medi sitting there in Medellin, Colombia, and talking to another indigenous tribal leader through two rounds of interpretation, you know, uh, the native language to Spanish to English, back to Spanish to the native language. And, and I'm sitting there and I'm looking in his eyes and we're talking and it's taken a while to kind of come back. And then his eyes start getting big and in, at first he's looking at me like with distrust like who's this gringo you know uh even though i look the way i look I'm like to him i'm a gringo right and then and then as we're talking he starts his eyes start opening and then that connection is there you know and so the conversation is on the same basis but he's operating when that session's over where do i go i'm, I'm there as a gringo guest of the u.s state department <laughs> Uh, I have all the protection in the world to be able to say what I want to say as long as I'm not attacking uh, something physically here in, in Canada. Uh, I can say what I want. Where does he go? He's got to go back to some village 50 miles from, from the city and worry about uh, machete wielding uh, right wing people or police coming to hold him to account for what he said in that conversation. So I'm very conscious of the privilege that we have as uh, leaders and academics and thinkers in this uh, global north, right? But 
I my criticism of academics and of uh, of people in our position has been that they have, for the most part, abandoned uh, that struggle. They have not tried to do what you're asking, which is how do we connect those struggles? How do we connect, first of all, that discourse? How do we connect um, our people? And the answer that I've come up with is there is a language barrier as well. You know, there's the indigenous language, there's Spanish, and then there's English. So it's hard in that basis. But then there's this this security threat, physical threat of violence that is much more present in these situations than when you when you operate here. And so I don't think that's reason to stop doing that work because part of resurgence and part of uh, our worldview is that that way of life, whether or not it's uh, your here in, uh, uh, in our territory or whether you're in Mexico or Colombia or Iran or somewhere else where it's people who are living in a respectful relationship to the earth against the, the manifestation of that, that threat, which today is the oil economy. It's the same here, it's resource extraction. So everything you described those indigenous people in the southern part of Iran experiencing is the same thing people in um, Northwest Territories or in remote areas of, of British Columbia are experiencing here. You have a resource that, that's needed and a, and a huge industrial capacity to extract that resource is set up. They are put off to the side and abused and ignored. And, and we have ways of articulating that struggle, but ironically, it hasn't really resulted in the stoppage of it. So you think about all the papers that are written by academics. I've written four books. Uh, I mean, I've tried to put myself on the ground and in getting involved in struggles, but most people write about it. We talk about it in the media. We tweet, we X about it. Is it tweet or X? I don't know. We, we, we put social media out there. We, we debate. The Wet'suwet'en are still having that pipeline run through their territory. After all of this, after all the court cases and all this stuff, all the social media, all the land defenses and all that, it's still happening. It got built. They're gonna start. They're gonna start pushing oil through it very soon, and and gas. So, is is our uh, is that space that we have false comfort or like a false sense of uh, of power? I would say, yeah, because it hasn't really connected to on the ground movements. It's kind of the opposite over there. They have on the ground movements. Well, in in Colombia, Mexico, they have on the ground movements. Zapatismo. They have all the tribal groups working to defend their lives and their self but they haven't articulated it uh, in, a, in a theoretical realm or in a realm that we can really relate to. So it's not really an answer to, to your question. It's more like thoughts on that question because I haven't really, I haven't really come to understand it fully uh, myself. I've experienced it, but I have the same question you have, like how do we connect those? Um, the one pathway that we had was the United Nations Working Group on Indigenous Populations, which operated and still is in operation thoroughly co-opted by states, uh, mainly Western states, uh, United States, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand, um, run those indigenous uh, spaces and limit their effectiveness. The definition of it, like, what does it mean in Canada and what does it mean in a country where, you know, there's there's no settlers, right? Mm. But there are indigenous peoples, but, you know, how do they cool that for indigenous people? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the very, the very definition of it is even problematic in a way. You know what I mean? Totally know what you mean. Yeah, we uh, we spend a lot of time thinking and talking about that in Indigenous academia. <laughs> How do you define indigeneity? What's the meaningful notion of it? Um, we tend to focus um, on the Commonwealth countries, you know, like and and the United States because that's our reality. But anybody who works in the field knows that it has vastly different meanings. I mean, in India, even in Mexico. Uh, what's indigenous in Mexico? It's it's linguistic based, right? It's it's a language you speak. It's not racialized in the same way that it is over here. And so, yeah, very uh, complex question that I think we have to keep in mind because I believe that our struggle is a global struggle. It's against imperialism. It's against empire. It's against and capitalism is the core is the core to that. It's an engine of that, of of everything, all this stuff. That, that continues to be piled on top of us, it's created by capitalism. And so we have to account for that and we have to look for strategies and learn lessons from other peoples who are confronting that and 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 learning to think through that in different ways, right? So for me, I've always had that kind of global perspective on, uh, on indigeneity. 
And uh, yeah, I, that's, it's fascinating. If I was still in academia, I think I'd still be trying to figure that one out, but now I'm focused on going to walk in. <laughs> Thank you for coming.